Uh, we'll call the, the hearing back to order. I guess it's my turn for questioning. Uh, Dr. Sias, once again, welcome. It's a great privilege to have you here representing the Commonwealth of Kentucky and Kentucky State University. Uh, you mentioned that uh, while HBCUs account for only 3 percent of the nation's colleges and universities, that you account for 30 percent of the uh, baccalaureate degrees and 40 percent of all uh, first professional degrees awarded to African Americans. What strategies are HBCUs using and, and maybe Kentucky State specifically to um, account for this disproportionate degree of success? I think uh, when you heard doc, Dr. Yancey talk earlier, and, and actually uh, Dr. O'Leary as well, they talked about the personal knowledge you have of your students, um, knowing who they are. I, too, know most of the students on my campus. If not by name, I know their faces uh, I, wherever I see them. Uh, if I see people who should be in class and they're not, I'm going to say something about it. We've improved our advising departments. And it's not just about uh, faculty members advising. That's their job. But we've hired professional advisors as well. We've put in technology that uh, the chairman had talked about earlier so students themselves can go online and put in their degree program and see where they should be. We've gone in and looked at our curriculum uh, structure over that nine semester period to see what our students should be taking, how are they taking it, are those courses being offered, and We've also done a few other things. Um, we have a degree completer award at Kentucky State University. We recognize that a large number of our students were getting up to that uh, year, last year and a half, and they weren't getting done because they were out of money. So we took some of our uh, need-based assistance and said, if you're out of money and you're within that 24 hours, we're going to help you get there because, to be perfectly candid, uh, it does a lot for us in terms of our funding formula, and we need to get those people out and in jobs. But I think a large part of it really relates to the personal care, understanding who the students are, uh, paying attention to what they're doing, and monitoring those midterm grades. If you see students have a problem, get them in. Uh, and we're even going to stop waiting until midterm and really um, go to an electronic version of class attendance so we know when they're not going to class so we can get on them about not going to class as well. There are also, I know, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Yancey, yes. I, I was going to add, uh, at Johnson C. Smith, we initiated something called the Freshman Academy, which is a learning community. We have placed all of our freshmen in learning communities when they arrive, and each of the learning communities have themes. We also have a sophomore initiative, but in order to do this, we had to expand our faculty from 80-odd to 103, so our, our teacher-student ratio is 13 to 1, and we also have mentors who are staff who are assigned to each of the learning communities, and that has helped. Our retention has not changed significantly, but there is a difference in the performance of students. They're doing better in classes, and I think that this supportive and nurturing community that we say we provide, we're actually doing it. I, I would just like to add one thing, and that is that our historically black colleges and universities have a legacy of receiving kids whose parents or whose teachers understand that to change their lives, they must be educated. And I don't think we've lost that in the student that shows up. They hunger for that degree, for an opportunity to really play in the, in the game, both in the social, the economic, and even the political, because we find our students are so politically active. They come with that desire. We just have to heat it up a little bit. Thank you. And, and, and Dr. Sais, when we've talked, you, you talked about the fact that so much we spend about 50 or 55 times more to uh, provide access to our young people in colleges than we do to keep them in the college. And the program that you've initiated at Kentucky State, which actually uh, helps kids who come with maybe not the, the foundational skills, the study habits, the time management, and so forth, which also is an important part of, of getting kids who are, I call them kids, I shouldn't, but getting young people who are fully capable of doing the work but need a little bit of that structure that they may have been missing. If you could elaborate a little bit on that, because yeah. one of the pieces of legislation that we have in the Higher Education Act is actually evolved from the discussions that you and I had. Absolutely. 
we're talking about students with developmental education needs. Uh, and we have an academic bridge program. In uh, Kentucky, 52% of all students who graduate, regardless of their color, graduate needing at least one course in remediation. For African Americans, that number is 77%. What we've done is establish a, an academic bridge program where we take those students with those developmental needs and we bring them in in the summer. Initially, we use their financial aid. The last two years, we've paid for it. Uh, it's increased the enrollment. It increases our retention. Uh, out of the students we had last summer, 93% uh, of those students were retained by the time we finished the end of that freshman year. You knock out the remediation, which means they start earning course credit immediately because not earning course credit uh, really is a problem for them and they get um, depressed about what's happening to them. Having student mentors, peer mentors, getting the reading, the public speaking, all of those things out of the way. We're getting ready to move to the next stage, which is also really looking at using technology to help with that remediation, uh, like you thinking about the learning communities. But what says that you have to wait for a student to get to your campus before you start remediation? Mm -hmm. Nothing really. I mean, it's, I think it's that important that we get it out of the way early. Uh, and we will be doing, even because we're up for reaffirmation, uh, our QEP will look at that whole first year experience and, and ours is really focusing on uh, a topic that's called academics with attitude uh, that deals with this whole first year experience and what we can do on every front to help those students. And you're right, it makes a tremendous difference having peer mentors and what I've seen is even more important when students step up and they can relate to other students and they see them not doing what they should be doing, uh, that makes a tremendous difference in our retention rate with those students. Thank you for asking the question. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your testimony this morning. Thank you for the contribution your students and institutions are making to our country. It's terrific. We're glad that you're here. Um, I'm assuming that institutions which have very high quality and very small endowments, which I think characterizes everybody here, a lot of the students need to have gap loans. They need to borrow money between what their financial aid package gives them and what they need to go to school. Is that a correct assumption? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Have you yet, I, I'm following up on something the chairman asked about, Mr. McKeon asked about, have you yet experienced any problems with lack of liquidity in getting loans for gap loans? Has that been a problem for any of the institutions here? With respect to Fisk, and I earlier said it has not been, but we were aware that this this tidal wave is coming, yeah. and so we've already begun to work with one of our major local banks uh, to, to secure an alternative how, how about the other institutions? Do you see a problem on the horizon, and if so, is there a way to deal with the needs of these students? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, or our Congressman. Well, you can call me that if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love promoting. Uh, Mr. President, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, l let me simply say that it just compounds a problem that exists for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, many of these students are not cre credit worthy. It's <laughs> Very few their students parents, are. Yes, yeah. are not credit worthy. So they don't have the option of yeah. borrowing in the same way that our more affluent students right. would have. So that's just the way it is. Yeah. Now, when you add on to that, the way that the economy now is going and what the impact of the mortgage lending and all of these other things with that, then that simply just compounds it. But I'm not sure that we see the dramatic effect because ours is already at such a low ebb. I just hope it doesn't get any worse because I know it would, it would, if the rest of academic community catches a cold, your, your students get pneumonia oh, as far as I can tell. Now, um, what I wanted to ask was, has anybody here had experience with the Lender of Last Resort program? Have any of you used it for your students? We, we have a couple of students yes, uh, who have uh, actually used a program like that, yes, sir. Has it worked? Has it been easy to access? Is it, is it something that works? First of all, the students really have to get the information about the program, yeah. and there's not enough information out there. Uh, they're often skeptical about what that means. 
Um, and I would say probably 50 percent higher interest rates and 50 percent of the people who go after it come back saying that they couldn't get couldn't do it. My, my, my prejudice here, um, head of the facts, my prejudice here is I think the tidal wave is coming. And I, my own view is that without some kind of guarantee behind attracting the capital, we're not going to attract the capital for these gap loans for your students. And although I know the lender of last resort program works in theory, I don't know that it works in reality. Does anybody else have any experience that? I, yes, ma'am. Another comment to make. Uh, it's almost like I grew up in a union household, and you know, you're the last hired and the first to be fired. <laughs> in 2001, when everybody talked about the depression that came in the fall, mm -hmm. it hit my campus in the spring. My students left owing over a million dollars in tuition. Right. All right. Now, this fall that we just had, 2007, we had large numbers of students who had to go back home because they could not get loans, they didn't qualify for loans, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So I don't know about the other people in this room, but we already know about the depression, or whatever you, you want to call it. Yes, ma'am. And I know it is going to get worse. I see that my time's about to expire when we want to move on. I, I, I want to just ask you all one, one time, the committee's going to start to consider this issue very intensely in the next few days. And I know we're going to want to draw upon you and your association for your expertise as we approach this. I, I hope that we're overreacting to a problem that doesn't come. But I think we're, the problem's coming. It's already here for a lot of students. We want to help those who already have the problem and avoid it for those who do not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could make just one other comment in this regard. Yes. To simply say to you, to use this opportunity to say that we really prefer not having the loans, but to have increases in Pell Grants and other kinds of assistance. As do we. And because if, I if we continue to go this way, then when students graduate, they are so burdened with Just to quickly debt. editorialize it, the Congress is going to make a decision in 2010 about what to do with the expiration of the Bush tax cuts. Personally, not speaking for the committee, here's what I'd do. The top 5 percent, which is people making over $300,000 a year, I'd let them expire. And I'd take the $1.5 trillion that would put back in the Treasury and make the Pell Grant program really mean something mm -hmm. in addition to other things. So that's what I would do, and I think that's the direction. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. At this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Julianne Malveau, president of Bennett College and noted syndicated columnist, and like uh, Chairman Miller and uh, Ranking Member McKeon, a Californian. And uh, we welcome her in the audience as well. Uh, at this point, I want to thank all the witnesses for their testimony. This has been a very interesting hearing, and as Congressman uh, Andrews mentioned, we'll be pursuing these subjects with great intensity. Uh, without objection, members will have 14 days to submit a additional materials or questions for the hearing record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>